Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, all eyes on the governor's pen. We look at what bills passed the 2024 legislative session and how they could change our state as the governor decides which she'll sign into law. And... New Mexico has some of the worst facilities in the country. The Office of the Inspector General has twice called for the closure of Torrance County Detention Facility. This is the government's own watchdog. An immigration attorney tells us why asylum seekers will continue to suffer in New Mexico after lawmakers once again voted down a detention reform bill. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. The New Mexico legislature ended with a swing of the gavel yesterday, and there's a lot to get into in tonight's show. In just a moment, we'll head back inside the Roundhouse once more with Gwyneth Doland, who catches up with several lawmakers and policy advocates to talk about a wide range of influential items. An attorney from the Western Environmental Law Center details the failure of a bill that would have strengthened control over the oil and gas industry. A Republican representative from Carlsbad explains why increased road funding will help drivers in her district. And a Democratic representative from Rio Rancho talks through some of the money set aside for health care in this year's record-setting budget. That's all in less than 15 minutes. A bill that would have prohibited New Mexico cities and counties from contracting with the federal government to detain asylum seekers died in the Senate earlier this month. It was a move that surprised advocates for immigration reform. Later in the show, executive producer Jeff Proctor speaks with Sophia Genovese, an attorney with the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center. The two talk about inhumane conditions that detained asylum seekers are experiencing in ICE prisons and asks why state Democrats helped kill the proposal that would have ended those contractual relationships. But first, recorded just an hour after the legislative session closed Thursday at noon, Gwyneth Doland speaks to a virtual roundtable of journalists about what passed and what didn't at the Roundhouse. Thanks, Lou. Joining us today at our virtual roundtable, we have Source New Mexico editor Sean Griswold and Trip Jennings, executive director of New Mexico In Depth. Glad to have you here, guys. Thank First, you. I want to talk about the budget. This was their one job, and lawmakers sent a $10.2 billion budget to the governor. Uh, let's just hit some of the highlights. Sean, it was a bigger budget than last year, not hugely bigger, 6.8% bigger. Still, the Rio Grande Foundation said it was a fail and padded with giveaways. Source New Mexico was there for the debate over the budget in the Senate. What was that discussion like? I wanna ask you, uh, Democrats hugely outnumber Republicans in the legislature and in the Senate. Did Democrats steamroll this budget or was there GOP support for it? The budget did have substantial support from Republicans in both the House and the Senate. And the major debate really does come off to the issue of reserves. You know, New Mexico is in a surplus. That's why we're in another record budget spending um, session. And but the concern that was brought up in a lot of the debate from both Republicans and Democrats was how much are we going to continue with this uh, cash flow? Obviously, that's dependent on oil and gas activity. And the concern is that industry can at times be volatile. So by saving money and putting money in reserves, um, the idea is that we're going to set this budget up to a point where when and if that actual industry starts to falter and New Mexico starts seeing fewer revenues from that, that the state won't have to do drastic cuts with the investments that it is doing. But I think what was substantial out of the debate is um, Senator George Munoz, who was really prominent in leading the budget conversation, is telling the Mexicans, you're not a poor state. Stop thinking you're poor. And that's coming from this identity of we are spending money on not only our government, but also initiatives to support people in the state. Yeah, there was a big surplus, uh, three and a half billion dollars in mostly extra oil and gas money. And the like squirrels, lawmakers stashed some of those acorns away, like a billion dollars worth of acorns away in funds and endowments aimed at creating what they were all calling future money. Uh, so there were funds uh, created and, uh, you know, plumped up for water, housing, transportation, uh, college scholarships and tuition, conservation. Trip, you've got the long view here. You've been watching this legislature almost 20 years. Are we looking at a major change in strategy in the state budget? 
I mean, I, I think, yes, as lawmakers and policymakers in New Mexico are looking 20 to 30 years ahead and seeing this, or maybe even 10 years, looking at this moment where the Permian Basin isn't producing as much oil and gas that, you know, basically helps with also the, the massive trust, uh, those those revenues help produce, what is it, they 40 to 45 percent of the state budget every year, oil and gas. And so... To, to, to Sean's point with the operational reserves, which is like, you know, what you have in the budget, uh, that's for year in, year out. They're thinking about, yeah, we need to create these trust funds that will, you know, if you're, let's take it down to a family. If you're a wealthy family, you've got, let's say, $10 million. Do you spend it all right now or do you set it in investments and then live off the interest, which can actually be pretty substantial. And that's kind of the principle here. That's what they're thinking about. And that will, their thinking is, in the future, that will reduce the volatility of the state budget. The question is, is how much? Because if you have these trust funds that are funding state agencies, sort of like the early childhood um department which has billions in their trust which is producing a lot of money to fund the agency so they're they're you know this is i think it's yeah they are they are thinking ahead not just uh a couple of years but decades in there with these trust funds and endowments that's how i view this I want to talk about taxes. The House put together a $200 million package that included income taxes for everyone, especially people who make the least. They also cut the capital gains tax deduction. So those who are earning money, you know, on investments, real estate, they can only deduct about 2,500 bucks. They flattened the corporate tax rate to 5.9%, uh, which will raise it by about $500 a year for businesses that bring in less than half a million dollars. Uh, Trip, how does this package compare to last year's tax package? Yeah, this was a very, it's very interesting. Uh, they really had a strategy around this thing because last year, the tax package, the omnibus tax package was about a billion dollars in costs. And a lot of that was the tax rebates that the governor had wanted to send to New Mexicans. Um, what happened last year is that she used, because it was an appropriation bill, and uh, under the Constitution, state constitution, if there's an appropriation bill, the, the governor has line item veto authority. So what she did basically was, you know, line item veto most of that omnibus tax bill last year. This year, they made a concerted effort to to create a a, 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 a omnibus tax uh, package that, you know, uh, tax and rev house chairman Derek Lente said is unbeatable. I think is during the early part of the session, what he meant was is like online I item vetoable. <laughs> and so she can veto the bill if she wants. It's not going to do because it raises revenue for the, I, I think, you know, um, well, anyway, it's a tax package. Sorry, I'm getting off on stuff. They, it, it, yeah, there's a lot of provisions here and they didn't want her to be able to go into this line item veto authority. Uh, with this line item veto authority, that's why it's smaller than last year. Um, because basically if she, the rebates is an appropriation, she could have used the line item veto authority. That's That's the strategy. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk more in a minute about some of the things that are in there, but something I remembered from Source New Mexico's reporting is uh, you guys, Sean, did a lot of work covering the fires in northern New Mexico. There's uh, some relief in the tax pageant, uh, package for people uh, impacted by the fires, am I right? Yes, and this has to do specifically with some of the representation that families or residents or individuals who are going through the federal FEMA process to rebuild their homes. And there's some of that tax rebates that will go directly to individuals who have either had their claims approved or in the process of getting it or when they finally do get it, will be able to receive some money back in expenditures they've spent ahead of before they got their claims. Um, now, that obviously is an issue because we're seeing a very slow rollout with FEMA dollars that goes to pay for people's rebuilding of their homes, tending their property. And so a lot of people have already put up money to get that going just so they have a place to live. 
And so these rebates are, in a sense, a way to help recover some of that money while also potentially even supporting a bit of the legal representation that some people have had to use to utilize and navigating the federal system. Now, that is going to be something that we're going to be following a little bit more because now you're essentially providing lawyers a little bit of a tax rebate for services that were already paid for. So we'll have more on that as we get as we understand a little bit more about what that does. And Trip, uh, New Mexico in depth did a lot of reporting, a major series on alcohol in New Mexico and the alcohol tax. Uh, was there was another big push again this year? Real briefly, what happened? Uh, basically, that was uh, you know it died in committee in the House Tax and uh, Revenue Committee last Friday. Partly, it's because now you have competing bills that have totally different. Uh, rationales or strategies for how to handle the crisis. We lead the nation in alcohol-related deaths, uh, the the rates, um, and so it basically, in a sense, it was uh, it was doomed by uh, you know competing bills among Democrats and um, a powerful you know. lobby also. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Very true. Yes. Uh, you know, big picture here. Do you guys think this tax package? represents in terms of some of its priorities, especially some of the green energy credits and things like that, uh, tax cuts for New Mexicans, higher corporate tax rate, capital gains. Does this represent uh, the increasing liberal bent in the legislature? Is that what we're seeing? Uh, Sean, do you think so? I mean, I would say that it falls in line. I don't know necessarily I would call it liberal bent because uh, the majority party in the federal government is Democrats and I be- Democrats, excuse me. And I believe that they're kind of falling in line with a lot of the federal policies that are providing tax credits on a federal level and codifying them at a state level to match what the feds are doing. You bring up, you know, clean energy or even electrification, you're going to see more tax credits that New Mexico is lining itself with the federal policies of the current federal administration. And so that's why I believe it's it's less liberal, it's more status quo and keeping New Mexico up with a lot of the federal dollars that are coming into the state. And we're seeing a lot of that you know, kind of process being built in. So New Mexico can actually receive a lot of the federal infrastructure money that needs that that is available for the state. Trip, let me come to you on this. We've got about a minute left. Uh, you know, looking back 20 years, a big change in the legislature's makeup since then. Do you see some of what is happening now as reflecting a younger, more liberal, more diverse membership? You know, I would I would say so, because back in the Richardson years, back uh, 2003, his first year, they basically had an income tax. It was highest rate was eight point two. Lowest rate was four point nine. They staggered it over several years to get a flat tax for point nine percent. This actually uh, the tax brackets, the lowest income earners are going to be paying less than they were before as I understand the tax package. So I, while I agree with Sean, I totally get what he's saying. I do think in the state, it does reflect this younger, more urban, more progressive kind of like leadership that you're seeing in the House and the Senate. Um, well, in the House, especially. So thank yeah. you, Tripp and Sean. We'll be back soon to talk about some of the other bills lawmakers sent to the governor. But first, a few conversations with lawmakers and policy advocates from my time inside the Roundhouse during the final week of the session. Tana's Fox, your big issue this session was reform of the state's Oil and Gas Act. What happened? This last session, uh, there was a governor-initiated reform package for oil and gas, really to hold industry better accountable. This effort I began really last year with um, legislation that we were pushing that would represent real reform of the 1935 Act, which hasn't been reformed uh, fully since then. The governor initiated a working group last summer composed of industry representatives, NGO representatives like myself, and the state. And we worked on various issues really, really hard throughout the fall and winter. That effort produced a governor-led bill, HB 131, that was to be heard in the House Energy Committee. And once that bill was filed, things fell apart. And I guess in a word, um, industry killed the bill and uh, it got out of um, 
two committees in the House but could not get to the House floor. So for purposes of this short session, Oil and Gas Reform Act um, is dead. But you did get some wins. Absolutely, there are some wins this center, uh, this session for the environment. Um, the legislature is going to fully fund the Land of Enchantment Legacy Fund. That's an amazing fund that helps fund state parks and, and uh, soccer fields and protects uh, lands all over New Mexico. That fund is now fully fund, fund, funded and sustainable you know, in perpetuity. We got development money for, to protect New Mexico surface waters, our streams, our rivers, our wetlands that are really threatened right now in light of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision last year, Sackett versus EPA, which really shrunk uh, uh, EPA's authority to protect New Mexico waters. New Mexico waters are particularly at risk because um, of the nature of the decision and the numbers of waters up to over 90 percent that are now not protected by the federal government. So that development money, that seed money is going to go a long way to helping to protect New Mexico surface waters. There's some tax credits too, right? There are there's seven tax credits that were passed, green tax credits that um, give tax credits for, for uh, EVs, for geothermal um, uh, uh, energy and, and the like. And those tax credits are really good. They will help uh, low-income and middle-income people uh, purchase EVs and they are really good climate measures. And heat pumps for people's homes. Exactly. Everybody can relate to a heat pump, yes. Representative Henry, you're from Roswell. Uh, oil and gas is the core of, the, it's the economic driver of your community. We were talking earlier about a big push to kind of reform the state's oil and gas law, right? Um, and it looks like it didn't happen this session. Were there some changes that the industry supported that you think would have been helpful? Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, you know, the, the act as it was, was really disproportionately harmful to smaller independent producers. And, and that's a core in, in Roswell and Chavez County and, and the surrounding areas. Uh, there, there are things, though, that I think could be done that industry would support to address some of the same concerns as, as the, what was in the Oil and Gas Act. Can you give me an example of some of the ideas that you would support as updates? Sure. Um, so the oil and gas conservation tax was originated in the 1950s, I believe around 1959. And originally that oil and gas conservation tax, which is still paid by every producer in the state, that tax originally went to the reclamation fund to address abandoned and orphaned wells. And we do have a, a, an abandoned and orphaned well problem here. I think the current administration under uh, Secretary Fuge is doing a very good job of addressing that with the funds they have. But there's not enough money in the fund. That's right. And part of that reason was because around 20 years ago or so, this legislature uh, changed the way the oil and gas conservation tax was distributed. Rather than 100% of it going to the reclamation fund, it first went to the general, it now first goes to the general fund and is then appropriated to the reclamation fund. And currently only about less than 20% of all that tax goes to the reclamation fund. There's been some movement to change that back, or maybe not to 100%, but for a lot more of that money to go for its true intended purpose, which is the reclamation fund. Representative Brown, when you go home to Carlsbad after this session, what are you going to tell folks there that you're most proud of having accomplished up here? There are several things that I think are really victories, uh, assuming the governor uh, keeps those intact. Uh, one of them for sure is transportation money uh, for our roads in southeastern New Mexico. Uh, it, it is actually a big win. Uh, we started off with a recommendation of the extra revenue, $3.5 billion, zero was recommended by the Legislative Finance uh, uh, Committee for road repairs. 
And I think we boosted it to 220 million. Um, I kept standing firm on that, that we needed to do more. And uh, working through the process, we ended up with some good road money. And then there's something happening on the Senate side that may actually funnel into road projects that I identified particularly and ran legislation on to get funding for, uh, for road work. Looking at Highway 308, um, 128, uh, 285 and 31. So people in my district will know those numbers. And you worked on uh, some education issues too. I sure did. So I've been a proponent for career technical education for many years and last year we made some gains, 40 million dollars uh, statewide and this year we're going to see about the same amount and the idea is to just put these career tech programs in every school in New Mexico. Uh, we're talking junior high and up and letting our students choose where to go with their talents and their interests. So we're, we're seeing a lot of movement now on CTE and I really am thankful that other legislators are on board with that now. What are some of the careers that kids in Carlsbad could be going into uh, that they could be working on while they're still in junior high and high school? Sure, so at Carlsbad High School in particular, they have now the academies um, set up and so students pick one to, to work through and we do have some uh, CTE lab renovations going on, so construction, auto mechanics, um, things in um, environmental uh, pursuits, things like that. So there's quite a bit there now, but uh, we, we need to expand those programs for sure. Representative Jones, you're a nurse. When you go back to Deming, what are you going to tell them that this legislature accomplished in terms of health care for areas like Deming? Yes, well, I'm particularly proud of the fact that we were able to push through the rural health care tax credit that would include nurses and, and several health care providers in rural areas. It allows them to see several thousand dollars in their pockets. Um, and, and that is a measure that's been, or a, a bill that's been um, put forward by Miguel, Representative Miguel Garcia, for many years now, I believe nine years, but he's allowed me to partner with him and make that a good bill. And it's getting through this this year. I'm really proud of that. And we've had trouble with rural hospitals struggling to stay open. Is there some help for them here? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we have passed um, some legislation this, this year that will help those hospitals keep their doors open and, and, uh, and especially in, in the rural areas because a lot of them are struggling. Some of them are having to close their doors for obstetrics. Uh, women have to travel long distances in some, some areas of New Mexico to deliver their baby or to get proper health care when they're pregnant. So we are working on, on that, on funding those hospitals, making sure they can keep their doors open. You serve on the House Health and Human Services Committee, uh, and the legislature has done a fair bit um, in terms of health care this session. What are the highlights that you are proud of? Well, I am proud that the committee recognizes that the health concerns of New Mexicans are complex and will not be resolved in one bill. So we are looking at drug transparency prices, rural health care, recruitment and retention of medical providers, disability access and opportunity, and, and many, many more to be able to create a comprehensive plan. And we're working on it year round to, to be able to address that. And how will the new health care authority help? Well, we will see. Um, uh, so as, a, as a all encompassing health care authority, they should have buying power to be able to lower some of insurance and drug prices. And, and that is the theory behind uh, creating this new uh, position. In the situation of immigration detention, State legislation is the most effective way to handle these injustices. This is a situation where the state legislature has a tremendous amount of power, more power than the congressional delegation, frankly, to do something about this, to step in and stand up for human rights. That interview with Sophia Genovese, an attorney with the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, will air in just over 10 minutes. Back to our panelists. The governor and environmental groups each had ambitious agendas this year different but ambitious. We just heard about some of that, but neither group got a lot of what they wanted. Um, Tripp, do you think that this uh, lack of movement on climate and environment issues 
uh, has to do with this being a 30 day budget session or is it the oil and gas lobby flexing? Uh, honestly, it's it's both and instead of either or. It is a 30 day session. As we know, that's primarily the budget. You, as you said, leading off the show, this is, you know, they had one big job and it's the budget. You, as we all know, there's a lot of movement in the 30 day session, a lot of flurry of activity. You don't have uh, the margin of error for getting something through is lessened and diminished during a 30 day session. So there's that. But, you know, oil and gas lobby, again, um, oil and gas revenues through all its revenue streams uh, pays for 40 to 45 percent of the budget, you know, in that range every year in, year out. So they they have a lot of they have a lot of influence up at the state house, as we all know. So it's to me, it's both and. Mm -hmm. uh, lawmakers did approve some green energy tax credits uh, in the package for geothermal electricity. Uh, geothermal heat pumps for consumers, uh, solar market tax credit, uh, clean car tax credit that includes used EVs and chargers, uh, advanced energy equipment that's uh, for solar and uh, wind uh, equipment used in, in the bigger uh, production. Sean, what happened to the governor's plan for a strategic water supply? Source has been all over this. Yes, and I do have to, you know, to begin with, Danielle Prokop, our reporter here, educates me every single day on water in New Mexico, and it's a complex thing. She talks about water as a language in New Mexico, and that's what we heard about. So to in short, the strategic water supply is a culmination of multiple water experts and stakeholders and industry people trying to develop how New Mexico can create a commodity market for water that is coming from oil and gas industry. This is used water that is used to produce and frack. All that money we're receiving goes, a lot of our water goes to create that. So the state wanted to create a commodity market where it can treat that water, turn it into a something solvable and sell it to other states. Now, we didn't have any details about this, even though this was a prominent um, initiative for the governor that started at the, not only in the state of the state, but even months before the, the session started. Still had no details. Got some small minor details about it through the session um, where there was a $500 million investment in this new program to establish this thing. Um, that completely changed. At the very last minute, the governor was able to um, – the governor and her administrators and her supporters in the, in the legislature brought a proposal up um, in the last week of the session that would have um, – cut this investment to $100 million and also would have cut out the oil and gas industry um, potable water they used and only used brackish water. Um, and from what we heard in sort of the process as to how this happened, advocates were completely opposed to the idea. They called it a, a bit of a bailout for industry. Um, industry never even spoke up in support for it in any committee hearings that it was spoken about. And so it was a little bit of a stumble by the governor on this part. While it was a major initiative, the criticisms that we heard from a lot of people about it was her position on moving it and pushing it through the legislature was a bit sloppy in a lot of ways. And ultimately now this thing is going to have to happen in a potential next session if it actually will. Yeah, that was a big idea and a big lift for a 30 day. I want to talk about good government for a minute. Legislators put a lot of money toward capital outlay this year. They had the money and, uh, you know, they threw some at old projects that needed to get finished. And there's a lot of new stuff in here uh, for infrastructure. Uh, Trip, you and I have spent a lot of time over the years talking about the lack of transparency in capital outlay. Uh, it used to be sort of a mega slush fund and kind of a mess. Uh, have they gotten better about it? Well, you know, in the last few years, I mean, yes, they've they've gotten better because uh, in coming weeks, you'll see with the capital outlay bill, they will actually list all the you know sponsors of every project. Uh, they used not to do that. Um, it took six or seven years to actually get that reform after we reported in 2015 that that you know that we didn't know who was sponsoring what projects. Uh, so they have gotten better about that. I will say with the 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 you know. If you guys were paying attention in the last, in the waning days of the session, uh, Senator George Munoz, who is the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, said next year he's he's probably not going to sign off on 
reauthorization for capital funding for old projects. And this because was the trouble we used to have. They'd throw some money at it, but not enough to get it finished. And it never went anywhere. And that money kind of languished. Yeah. It's, I noticed it's a, they've it's added, perennial. you know, they've yeah. added this transparency. And in several places, they've added more accountability measures. Junior bill money used to be a pile of earmarks. Uh, and now they've turned that into uh, the GROW, G-R-O projects that not only uh, have some transparency to them, more transparency, but also some accountability, which is interesting. I want to talk about education here for a minute. We uh, at, up at the Capitol talked about some changes to the graduation requirements, making them more flexible. And throughout the session, we heard more about increasing opportunities for CTE, career technical education, internships, training, uh, helping students move straight from high school into high paying trades. Uh, lawmakers gave raises to teachers 3%, put more money toward the lottery and opportunity scholarships. One thing that passed late in this session was a bill requiring affirmative consent. Sean, Source New Mexico had a story about confirm, uh, affirmative consent. Can you just give us some insight there? Yeah, this has been a proposal that's is about five years in the making. It was an element that would provide a lot of the ideas of how you talk about sexual um, relationships in, in K through 12 is how it originally started. This year's version was focused per, predominantly on higher education. The, proponent, the supporters for the bill cut out the K through 12 elements, made it to higher ed, a lot of it was in response to the um, hazing lawsuit that happened at New Mexico State University with their basketball team. Um, it passed through the Senate. And what it does, it actually really just aligns with some of the federal standards you have with Title IX in providing um, resources and support for victims who are uh, of, of sexual assault and harassment and providing resources for students at the very beginning when they get to college about this is how you need to deal with interactions training in a way when it comes to navigating the elements of, of just generally working with being around people. And I should say that, you know, we've covered this here at New Mexico in Focus. UNM has been doing this for a long time. So this is not actually a significant change because it only applies to higher ed. Like you said, it would have been very significant if it had applied to K-12. Trip, your colleague Bella Davis covered the effort to pass a tribal education trust fund. I thought that was in the budget. I saw money in the budget for that. What happened? So, yes, you did see bu uh, money in the budget. What happened was, and, uh, you know, this was the second year that it was proposed. Um, this year, uh, they had a year to kind of prepare. Um, and uh, there, what happened is it looked like it was going to pass. $50 million in the budget. Uh, again, this is the model of like 50 million, then it produces interest that the tribes could then use to actually help with their own educational, like their own educational programs within their communities and also in urban and other areas off, off uh, the communities. Um, what happened was in, in, in the end, in the last days, uh, it, it looked like it was going to pass 66 to zero or something like 68 to zero, maybe in the house. They passed it out, looked like it had momentum. Um, and then it kind of like uh, just basically stalled in the Senate. In the last couple of days, we started hearing uh, word that maybe there was some maybe some people had some problems with it. And yesterday, uh, the House tax uh, chairman, committee chairman, Derek Linte told us, uh, told Bella that uh, he was gonna pull the bill. It was sitting on the floor and there were gonna be, Senate floor, there were gonna be a lot of amendments and he just didn't think he could get it through in time and he asked Peter Worth not to run it. Sean, we have about a minute left here. What does this mean for education for tribes and pueblos? And how do, how do you think the legislature did overall in responding to their legal obligations uh, resulting from the Yazzie Martinez lawsuit? Well, um, what's going to happen is you see my buddy here, Robert Knott, just for a second showed up. He wanted to sign in. But what ultimately what this means is that uh, New Mexico is going to be in Yazi Martinez for probably decades. I imagine we're going to be covering this mandated education reform probably for the rest of our careers in journalism and for the next group that's coming up. Thanks again to you two. We will return to this group in less than 15 minutes, and I'll ask what public safety bills didn't make it through both chambers at the Roundhouse. Going into this year's session with the support of House Speaker Javier Martinez, advocates were cautiously optimistic about their immigration detention reform proposal. 
The Dignity Not Detention Bill would have barred New Mexico cities and counties from entering into contracts with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement to detain asylum seekers. That bill met an early end in the Senate this month, as six Democrats joined Republicans and another three vanished before the vote to kill the bill by just three votes. Sophia Genovese, an attorney with the New Mexico Immigrant Law Center, stopped by our studio and told executive producer Jeff Proctor when she knew the bill's life would be cut short. Sophia, thank you very much for coming and welcome back to New Mexico in Focus. Thanks for having me. Um, we just heard from Lou that Senate Bill 145, which has commonly been known as the Dignity Not Detention Bill, uh, died on the Senate floor in an incredibly narrow vote for the second year in a row. And I wanna get your reaction and sort of a description of how that happened. But I'd like to start with having you tell my viewers how many of these immigration detention facilities there are in New Mexico and where they're located. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so New Mexico has three immigration detention facilities. These are supposed to be operated by ICE, but instead what we do see is ICE subcontracting these responsibilities out to counties who then subcontract those responsibilities out to private prison companies. And so New Mexico has three of these facilities. We have Torrance County Detention Facility, Cibola County Correctional Center, and Otero County Processing Center. In the case of Torrance and Cibola, these are both owned and operated by Core Civic, which is a Tennessee-based private prison company. And it's really interesting, the contractual relationship, ICE contracts with the counties who then contract with these companies. And that allows ICE to circumvent ordinary procurement requirements that you typically see in, in federal contracts with private corporations. By contracting with the counties, ICE gets to sidestep these responsibilities. And that goes along with, you know, not having to look into the performance history of these companies. And so the counties are really operating as shields to accountability. And in, in the case of Otero County, Otero County actually owns that facility, but contracts out with the private prison companies. All three of these facilities detain asylum seekers who've recently arrived from the southern border. Torrance and Cibola, they hold asylum seeking men. And then in Otero, we see men and women. Again, these are recently arrived asylum seekers. Under federal law, their detention is completely discretionary. It's truly random who gets deported, who gets detained, and who gets released at the border. It's up to the discretion of border patrol agents. But this decision impacts lives so significantly. We see people in detention lose their cases at far greater rates than people who are not detained and able to seek asylum from the comforts of their homes and have access to holistic services. In New Mexico, there's six of us doing this work, six attorneys providing representation to detained asylum seekers to a population of about 2,000 people. That's just not enough people to ensure due process, to ensure that everyone has access to the asylum system. So as a result, we see tremendous due process violations on top of what we think are ordinary systemic uh, prison conditions, poor conditions, and humane conditions that people are subjected to. That was actually gonna be my next question. In New Mexico, what are these places like? All three facilities are horrifically understaffed. I think that's a problem across prisons in New Mexico generally, and it's certainly the case in th these three facilities. And that leads to a number of problems. People are subjected to prolonged periods of solitary confinement because they're simply forgotten about. We hear all the time how people are put in medical quarantine for two weeks and not given enough food in those time periods. The facilities themselves are struggling. There's crumbling, crumbling infrastructure. There's regular sewage leaks. People in Torrance, for example, were sleeping in sewage in their dorms because they couldn't get staff out there to fix it quickly enough. There's medical deficiencies, and I think language plays a part of that, that barrier in accessing services. We recently had someone who was deaf who couldn't communicate his needs because there wasn't a, a Spanish sign language interpreter. And so there's, there's a myriad of, of issues really, but it, it comes down to understaffing and a lack of accountability. So let's talk a little bit about Senate Bill 145, the parade of horribles that you just laid out. What would that bill specifically have done to address that and this question more broadly? 
SB 145 built on a movement of states saying that they would no longer be complicit in the human suffering that is systemic in ICE detention. And what it specifically does is prohibit contracts between local state entities and ICE for the purposes of civil immigration detention. These contracts are discretionary for public entities to enter into. Nothing under federal law requires public entities to be involved in civil immigration enforcement. And so SB 145 really went after those contracts to prohibit these types of agreements to increase accountability, but really to try and get New Mexico out of the business of detaining people for civil immigration violations. One more question before we get to what happened to the bill, just so that my viewers are crystal clear here. When you talk about asylum seekers, what does that mean legally? Are these folks who are in fact accused of committing a crime? No, people who are crossing the border and seeking asylum are absolutely not committing any crimes. In fact, one must be within the United States jurisdiction, within our territories to seek asylum. It's not possible to simply apply from Mexico and, and wait your turn in line. That's, that's not how the law works. It requires one to actually be here. And so when one seeks asylum, says they want to file an asylum application, they are, they are not committing a crime. Okay, so let's get to the bill and sort of what happened to it. It really seemed, at least from where I was sitting early in the session, like the bill had some momentum this time. Were you optimistic in a way that you weren't last year? What was the messaging from the legislature and from the governor around the bill heading into the session this year? We came into the session with so much community support. There are so many faith groups across the state, community groups across the state who galvanized and organized over the past year to support this bill, recognizing the horrors that are occurring in these facilities. And so we went into the session very confident, cautiously optimistic because it's 30 days, but we were optimistic. And we had the support of leadership. We had the support of Speaker Javier Martinez, who has made this a priority. And we felt confident. And we felt confident after our first Senate uh, committee hearing and after our second committee hearing, we thought we were really going to get this passed. Tell me a little bit about what you heard during the debate on the Senate floor um, and how did that change your outlook for the prospects of the bill? Was it crystal clear to you that this was going sideways again once it got to the floor? We received indication shortly before the floor debate that some deals had been made and what those deals were were not entirely clear. But by the time we got to the floor, we knew that we had lost some votes um, for a variety of reasons. And the floor debate really wasn't much of a debate. It was several legislators making statements that were quite offensive and not based in fact. And so it was more performative than actual legislative work happening on the floor. So then what happened when it came time to vote? We, we knew, um, again, that we didn't have the votes. What we heard instead were people justifying their no votes, people who had previously been supportive, trying to say, well, it'd be better if people were detained in New Mexico because we're a welcoming state. We're much better than, than Texas. Or these folks need to be detained because they're military-aged men who are going to, who knows, invade, invade the country is, is what essentially we were hearing on the floor. We heard a lot of racist and xenophobic remarks and things, again, that just weren't based in reality. So the new slogan for New Mexico should be better than Texas? That's what the justification was on the floor. And again, it's just, it's not based in reality. New Mexico has some of the worst facilities in the country. The Office of the Inspector General has twice called for the closure of Torrance County Detention Facility. This is the government's own watchdog calling for a closure of a facility. That has never happened before. That is pretty clear indication that we have some of the worst facilities here. Why does this keep happening? Why do these bills continue to be proposed seem like they're cruising and then meet these incredibly razor thin margins when they get to a floor vote. Why does this keep happening? It's a good question and I don't know if I have the perfect answer, but I think there's fear in communities. Um, it's, it's not accurate fear, but it, there's a fear that, oh, okay, we're gonna take away jobs if we cancel these contracts. When in reality, these prisons would stay open if 
this bill were to pass and these facilities are all understaffed, it's probably not going to result in job loss. It's not going to result in less money coming to the counties when there's a variety of initiatives to spur economic development in the locations where these facilities are, such as the geothermal bill or Sunzia and lots of sustainable energy jobs that are, are making their way to these, these locations. So I think it's a, a misplaced fear that's not based in reality. So I think a lot of viewers will be good and well familiar with congressional and executive failures at the federal level to deal with migration. Um, now the New Mexico legislature has refused, declined for two consecutive years to address these particular detention facilities. What does that say to people who land in our state and are seeking asylum? Yeah, I think in the situation of immigration detention, state legislation is the most effective way to handle these injustices. This is a situation where the state legislature has a tremendous amount of power, more power than the congressional delegation, frankly, to do something about this, to step in and stand up for human rights. And now, you know, we have to go back to the drawing board because we know our federal advocacy is not going to work in an election year. We're not going to convince the president and Secretary Mayorkas to cancel these contracts. We've tried and they've told us absolutely not. And so we will be regroup regrouping over the next year to really demonstrate to legislators who voted no or walked away from voting that this bill is critical to preserving human rights and, and ensuring that no more deaths occur in New Mexico's ICE facilities. Where are asylum seekers to turn for either redress of grievance or for help? There are three organizations providing services to people in detention and we do our best to monitor human rights abuses. My organization, we're in these facilities weekly and we submit complaint after complaint to the oversight agencies in the federal government. And the oversight agencies, I think, are, are sympathetic. As I mentioned earlier, the Office of Inspector General has called for the closure of Torrance twice, but at the end of the day, they don't have any enforcement authority. The only people who can cancel these contracts at the federal level are Secretary Mayorkas and, and President Biden. And so we will continue to uplift these complaints, but we need the New Mexico legislature to step in because it's clear the executive will not. I assume we'll see this bill again next year, Sophia. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me about this today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks to Sophia Genovese for that interview. Let's return one last time to our virtual roundtable. Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham made public safety a priority this year. She announced more than 20 initiatives uh, and she talked about improving outcomes for people that could prevent crime. But Sean, what did lawmakers send her on guns? She had a lot of ideas. What happened? Well, she had two ideas that end up at, on her desk, and even those ideas were amended and diluted in a way from their original proposals. Number one, you have now a seven-day waiting period to purchase a gun. That was originally proposed as a 14-day waiting period. Uh, the second bill that's on her desk is um, the banning of um, weapons at polling places, and that was also amended to where if you have a concealed uh, carry permit, you can actually take your gun and vote if you feel like you need to. So even with those gun bills that are on her desk that she is expected to sign, they were also um, you know amended and diluted in a way that didn't get exactly what she wanted. Yeah, and in terms of other uh, kind of tough, tough on crime ideas, she did get an increased penalty for second degree murder. She did not get increased uh, flexibility for prosecutors who want to hold people behind bars uh, when they're accused of serious crimes. Now, Tripp, it's an election year. Do you think lawmakers are gonna leave Santa Fe with something to brag about uh, with what they've done on crime? And also, how important is that outside of uh, of the cities, really? I mean, you know, it, it really depends on who you're talking about as far as a lawmaker goes. If you're, uh, you know, in a rural district and you're basically, uh, you know, some you've got a lot of constituents who are like, uh, hey, we need our guns. We're in rural parts of the state. 
Um, the seven day waiting period, which some people in the urban, um, some progressives or people in the urban areas will go, that's a great big win. They might say, oh, well, we don't need that, you know, in rural parts of the state, um, you know, elsewhere, like I said, maybe in urban areas or more progressive leaning areas, that is a, a, a big, a, a big win for people who are supportive of that stuff. Uh, similar to the, the guns in the public places. I mean, let's face it, gun violence is a, a big issue here in New Mexico. Mexico, as it is across the state uh, every week. We just had something happen in Kansas City, you know, this week uh, where there was a shooting. Every week we, you know, run around, we, we hear about news uh, uh, around gun violence. So I think it really depends on who you're talking to on, on, you know, election year and how they can use it in their platforms as they're running. Not a massive liberal win, but not a massive uh, conservative defeat either. Sean, uh, thinking about some of the things the governor framed in her state of the state address in terms of uh, the root causes of crime. Um, you know, she she talked about the state's housing crisis and they did get a little movement there, didn't they? Yes. So the governor was also looking for another half a million, sorry, half a billion dollars in investments to create more agencies within the state to develop money to invest in housing development. Now, that didn't go. That was also cut a little bit. But what she does have right now is about $175 million to go into an agency that will now look to develop ways to invest in development of homes for people who are not low income, mostly the people in the middle. Don't make enough money to purchase a home. Don't make enough to, or make more, more than to receive any type of subsidies. And so she's really trying to make this as a investment for developers to provide those homes and those options for home buyers. And that's going to be something we're going to have to follow. That's going to become another issue into next year as well. Yeah, it's it's a real challenge for folks who are uh, just starting out their careers now. The home prices have changed a lot. Sean, sticking with you for a minute, there was a bid to require paid family medical leave and that failed uh, at the end, but it looked like it was going to pass. What happened? Well, looks and appearances are very important because this has, has had a very strong support from not only Senate leadership, but advocacy and lobbyist groups have been highly prominent in it. They bring in dozens, if not hundreds of people throughout the year to, to, to lobby on behalf of this. Workers, people who are general New Mexicans, um, and it failed on a very short vote. And, and similar to what we saw with some of the gun legislation, you have conservative Democrats in the state who are aligning themselves with Republicans in ways that they feel like not only will support their rural ideals, but also their business interests. And you had several Democrats vote against the bill that did ultimately kill paid family medical leave. Yeah, and I saw a lawmaker say, now I can't remember if it was a Democrat or Republican, saying what my chamber is against this, you know, the business community is really against this. How am I supposed to go home from Santa Fe and say that I did this uh, to, to hurt the business community? And that's, that's a tough call. Uh, again, this was a 30-day session packed with non-budget related items. Uh, advocates for modernizing the legislature, helping them do more, uh, wanted longer sessions. They didn't get it. They wanted pay for state lawmakers. Didn't get it. What they did get was $6 million in the budget for paid staff. Tripp, what kind of difference do you think that will make? I mean, I, I think it will um, it will help lawmakers. Uh, as we know, they're a volunteer; they're not paid a salary. Uh, basically, this the hope is is that when you have professional year round staff, that they can do a constituent work. Maybe they can help lawmakers do that. They also can do research for lawmakers. This is really important, um, as, especially as with the, the complexity of some of the bills we saw this yes. session. That's right. And what you have is uh, with every legislative body, Congress, other state legislatures, later uh, leg legislature, sorry, um, it, lobbyists have a lot of influence. But when you have a volunteer legislature, lobbyists have even more, uh, uh, you know, influence on writing bills, technical assistance. Possibly these professional staff might be able to maybe push up against that. Not saying that lobbyists are bad. They're part of the system. They've been part of the system since the founding of the country. But, You're right. Yeah. And, you know, I had, as you know, Trip, because both of you helped me, I had 14 UNM journalism students with me up at the session this year, and they learned a ton about the value of lobbyists and about yes. the expertise that they have. So that's a strong point. 
Uh, you know, a lot of lobbyists are former lawmakers. A lot of them have been there decades longer than any of the elected officials. So paid staff does have the potential, potential to counteract some of that. Um, speaking of these lawmakers, a lot of state senators announced that they're retiring. Uh, at least eight. That's Tallman, Pirtle, Schmidis, McKenna, Griggs, Neville, Moores, and uh, Jerry Ortiz Pino. That's actually 20%, just about 20% of the state Senate uh, that will be new next session. Over the past few years, we've seen a sea change in the makeup of the state house, right? It's now majority women, people of color, many younger people. Is this what's coming next for the state Senate? And what would that mean? Sean, what do you think? Yes, to answer your question, that's, it, that's exactly what it's going to be. We're going to see a whole new blend of makeup of what New Mexico is. New Mexico is completely different than so many other states. And we all know that through our diversity of just who we are as a people and our culture and everything. And that's going to be reflected in a lot of these spaces. Um, now, we will still see, because they are a volunteer legislature, a lot of people who are in prominent spots, who are lawyers, who are, who can take the time to you know volunteer for a month or two months out of a year to do this role, but they will come with the values that are going to be part of what New Mexico is. Now, some of those people you do rep that you mentioned are Republican representatives who represent very conservative districts that are flush with cash in the oil and gas industry. And so we may start seeing even more prominent oil and gas advocates who may have some sort of liberal social um, viewpoints on on social policies, but are ultimately there to protect the industry that is funding all of this. Trip Jennings, one word, redistricting. How much change are we going to see in the Senate with these eight seats? I mean, that's a really interesting question because I, I just learned that my senator is no longer my senator because of the redistricting. I didn't, I just learned this uh, during the session. So now uh, you're that, in Rio Rancho. So that is a potential swing, but the rest yes. of these seats are pretty solid, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, no, no, but you're right because it's got, uh, you're exactly, Rio Rancho can, you know, depending on how that district is, is fashioned, it can, it will be a, a swing district. You're exactly right. Last question here previewing the next session we're going to have a bunch of changes we're going to have new butts in seats but what do you think are some of the issues that we're going to be talking about maybe things that didn't happen and are going to come back uh next session sean what's what's on your in your notebook for next session i think we're going to see paid family medical leave make another return that's not going to end i think we're going to see a lot of bills that were structured this year like we talked about housing with the trust fund you know, that bill is establishing essentially an administrative office to develop how to invest that money and build it out. Now, next year, they're going to come back and ask for more money because now they have the infrastructure set up. So we're going to see a lot of these trust funds that, that have been discussed recently now turn into asking for more money to either keep it going or even adopt some of the programming and the, and the, and the, the, and the programs that they are trying to do and then get those funded in other ways. So while it is budget and we're spending the money, we're going to now see next session what the what how you turn real money into something real. And that's what we're going to see a lot more next year. Guys, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking this time with us and for breaking it down and for your work over the last 30 days. Both you, Tripp and Sean, and your teams, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for following along with us through this year's legislative session. You can find even more interviews with lawmakers and policy advocates on our social media pages. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.